This was not the plan. I will tell you the original plan. The original plan was that tomorrow we would go to Israel with our Sinai Temple family mission. And in two weeks, I would come back like the spies in Joshua, and I would tell you how great it was, and we'll keep moving on and begin Rosh Hashanah in a couple of weeks. But then this week happened. For two years, we've been planning this family mission to Israel. And when you plan a mission, you talk with a tour agent, and if you go on our website and you see the places that we're going to go, it's no surprise. Matsada, the Dead Sea, Jerusalem's Old City, camel riding, Judean Desert. Most of the people on this mission are either going for the first time to Israel or they are going with their children and grandchildren who are going for the first time. Well, what the tour guide didn't put into our itinerary was witnessing 30 weeks of protests in the streets of Jerusalem and Tel Aviv and around the entire country, which as you know is pretty small. Where I grew up, it was the size of New Jersey. Where our children grew up, it's the size of San Bernardino County. And so this week, as you all are probably aware, was the passing of the reasonableness bill significantly curtailing the powers of Israel's Supreme Court. And if there's one thing that I have learned as a rabbi, it's that I'm not a political analyst. But I do hope that sometime after Shabbat, you, if you have not already, not simply read a statement that we put out by Sinai Temple or many other, if not all, Jewish organizations this past week, but dive into the information that we provided for you. Podcasts and articles and writings of scholars so that you can dig deep into what these two confusing words of judicial reform really mean. And so before I get into the Torah piece, it's just important to, in two sentences, outline what exactly both sides are speaking or disagreeing about. In brief, those who would like to see judicial reform argue that this legislative change makes Israel's checks and balances equivalent to other Western democracies and promotes democratic values. On the other hand, the critics of the reform believe that this judicial reform will do the exact opposite and will destroy secular and democratic values. But today I'm not here to speak about policy. There are people who do that much better than me. But I'm here to speak about peoplehood. This past week was the 9th of Av, what is known as the saddest day on the Jewish calendar, marking and commemorating the destruction not only of the first but the second temple. And if you look throughout history, many Jewish calamities over the years. And if there's one thing that we did see this week, it is the undeniable rift between a Jew versus a Jew. Jew versus Jew. And if we don't think that has direct consequences, I'll only list a few. Our good friends in the north of Israel, Hassan Nasrallah from Hezbollah, he said, it was good to see the worst day in Israel's history this past week. Possible economic turmoil, with credit ratings perhaps going down, investors threatening to pull out of Israel not because of BDS, but because of what they see happening between citizens of Israel. Iran and Hamas quietly cheering the demise of the state of Israel. And so tomorrow we will still go to Israel with a full bus. Next Shabbat I won't be here, but I'll be in Jerusalem with our family, with our children going for the first time. And today I will not promise you any solutions to any political reform. But, as a rabbi always does, I'm going to ask all of us to ponder three questions that we can think about in what we're seeing. The first, how should a Jew act in the world? There was a book written, written by Elie Wiesel, the Holocaust survivor, in 1976, and it was called A Jew Today. 
1976, over 40 years ago. He wrote, I quote, I was told that to be a Jew means to prevent one from excluding the other or succeeding at the expense of the other. He says a Jew, if you're looking for an ancestor to follow, should follow our father Avraham. Because Abraham not only questioned, but was questioned by God. Wiesel says to be a Jew is to precisely reveal oneself within one's contradictions by accepting them. If you've ever opened up a page of Talmud and you see the arguments that go back and forth between rabbis, it's frustrating because it often ends with the word teku. Teku means it will stand. But it will stand doesn't mean that the answer of a rabbi will stand, but it means that the question will stand. Teku means that there is no answer to the question at hand. There are teku appears 317 times in the Talmud, meaning most of our arguments between the rabbis and between Jews and Jews often ends up in asking another question. And so what is the question that we have to ask ourselves while watching what's happening in the streets of Israel? Leah Leibovitz from the Commentary Podcast, he's also on the well-known podcast Unorthodox and writes for Commentary Magazine. He says this is the question. How can we have conversations about the necessary growing pains of democracy without becoming fatalistic and beholden to a negative narrative? How can we have this conversation without seeing what we're seeing? To be a Jew is to invite the question and not shun the question. Just over a month ago, I was back in Israel, actually with Angela Badahi sitting behind me, as part of the Israel Center's Sinai Temple Rabbinical School Fellowship with 16 students across eight seminaries, and we invited the questions. Our days looked like this. We met Palestinian leadership from Bethlehem on the same day we met Jewish-Israeli leadership from the West Bank town of Efrat. In the Knesset of the parliament building where these disagreements are happening, in the same room, we sat with a member of Likud and a member of Yesh Atid. In the same room. Sitting in the Israeli town of the West Bank of Ariel, we met Avi Zimmerman who coordinates business opportunities between Palestinians and Israelis. And in the same room, we met Yariv Oppenheimer, the founder of Shalom Achshav, Peace Now, who said why we shouldn't be sitting in that room. We invited the question. In Elie Wiesel's manner, we promoted asking why. Question number two. How do we teach our children? Jonah, for his, this morning, bar mitzvah, said the Shaman V'yahavta. That same Shaman V'yahavta that we say every morning and every evening, it's in our Torah reading this morning. The Shema comes from Parshat Ve'erchanan, and in that V'yahavta, we all know the words, V'shinantam bam. V'shinantam levanecha v'dibarta bam. That we should teach our children and impress upon them these words. When the commentaries look at these words of the Shema, they emphasize that we can't only teach them, but we cannot lose the meaning of the words over time. And it's the 13th century Torah Haroch that writes, if we don't pass these words on to our children, they will die. And so the Talmud says, it's not Vishinan Tambam that we should teach our children, but it should say Vishilash Tambam from the word Shalosh. We should study them, we should repeat them, we should study them again. Because when we do that, it will lead to action. You know, we say these words twice a day, but today I'm really thinking about them because when our children get on that plane to Israel and we land in Tel Aviv on Monday morning, and when they see this land that they've been taught about in our schools at Sinai Akiba Academy for the first time with their eyes, I ask myself, what do I want my children to see in how Jews act towards each other in this land. 
What Israel do I want to show my children tomorrow for their first experience in the Jewish democratic state? How will I teach them that, yes, there can be many opinions that exist here? And finally, the third question. Can we see in each other's hearts? You know, when we talk about the Shema, in the mission of the rabbis asked, May Ematai Korin et Shema Beshacharit. When is the earliest time that we can say the Shema in the morning? And of course, there's lots of opinions. But one that I think is applicable to this conversation, the answer is, Mishi Yakir ben Tchelet Ulalavan. The earliest you can say the Shema in the morning is when you can see and distinguish between blue and white on your tzitzit. Now it's not simply seeing a color, but the deeper meaning of what it means to see at that time is that you can see a person in front of you and what's in their heart. This has been a difficult week, not simply for the state of Israel, but for the Jewish people. We literally have witnessed our people torn apart. But if you watch closely, and if you're on social media, or any type of device, you also see a moment of hope. There was a beautiful video circulating around of two escalators. There was one going up, and of course one going down. The one going up were people going to the protest of the side that they wish to support, and the one going down was going from the protest that they had just concluded. But each single person on both sides of the escalators were waving flags. And it was the same flag of the people of Israel. And a caption under that picture reads, I quote, the path forward is unity, not uniformity. The path forward is unity, not uniformity. You read the book, Der Judenstadt, which is the Jewish state, which Theodore Herzl wrote in 1896, which of course was 52 years before the founding of the state of Israel. Towards the end of that book, there's a section, just a very small paragraph, and it's called The Flag. Herzl writes, we have no flag, and we need one. If we desire to lead many people, we must raise a symbol above our heads. And so tomorrow morning, the plan stays the same. We'll go to LAX, and we'll get on an LL airplane. What I'm going to point out to my children is not what seat number we're in. But before we get on that plane, they're going to look at the tail. And on that tail, as you know, of the LL airplane is Degel Yisrael. It's that flag that Herzl dreamed of. Because it's the flag that encompasses all the opinions of the Jewish people, some of the opinions we may completely agree with. And it's okay because some of those opinions we may completely disagree with. Some of the arguments can have 100% solutions. But many of those arguments will end with teku, meaning it will stand. But the one thing that I do know is that we only have one flag. One flag and one state for the Jewish people. And it's up to us to ensure that this flag, this Degel Yisrael, with the Magen David, that Star of David, will fly above all of our heads forever. Shabbat Shalom.